<clears throat> All right, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to our presentation. My name is Bahar Syed. I'm Alex Barney. I'm Aiden Williams. I'm Mike Galford. And we did our senior capstone on non-destructive testing of wind turbine blades using thermal imaging with the assistance of our advisor, Dr. Jonathan Miles. I would like to begin with a brief overview of what we will be discussing today. First, I will start with the justification and introducing the problem. That will then lead into the literature review where we will go more in depth on the extensive research we have conducted in the past year, which set the scope for our project. From there, we will continue on to our experimental design and we will discuss the results we found. And finally, we will conclude with recommendations for future projects. The figure on the right depicts annual energy consumption by source and sector in 2015. The sources include fossil fuels, such as petroleum, natural gas, and coal, as well as nuclear electric power and renewable energy. The sources are spread amongst four different <coughs> sectors, transportation, industrial, residential and commercial, and electric power. In 2015, the U.S. consumed 97.7 quadrillion BTUs of energy, and only 10% was produced by renewable energy. Most of the renewable energy produced in this in the United States is utilized in the electric power sector, and of that, 35% was generated by wind. Renewable energy plays a significant role in our energy sector because it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. With such a small amount of renewable energy produced, there's a lot of room for improvement and opportunity for the industry to grow. The figure on the left shows annual wind power capacity growth from 2001 to 2016. This growth can be attributed to the Renewable Energy Production Tax Credit and the Business Energy Investment Tax Credit. The PTC and the ITC expiration date was extended back in 2015 until the end of 2019. And for the PTC, facilities that begin construction within the first year receive the full tax credit. However, each year after it decreases by 20%. The ITC varies depending on the size of the system, but it works in the same way in that it decreases after the first year by 6% each year. These policies have allowed the wind industry to expand and now that long time support is in place. And you can really see how influential these policies are. Um, if you look at the chart, um, in the early 2000s, you don't see as much growth because of failure to extend the credit before it expired. However, if you look at 2008 and 2015, development starts up again, which indicates years the tax credit was renewed. By the end of 2016, we had an installed wind power capacity at 82,183 megawatts of power with a projected growth of 224 gigawatts by 2030. Wind energy is produced by the turbine converting kinetic energy of the wind into mechanical energy, which is then converted into electricity. Kinetic energy is a cubic function of wind velocity, so even a slight increase in wind speeds can have an enormous impact on the energy produced. Um, the best sources of wind can be found off the northeastern coast, which are the areas colored in the orange and red hues, with wind speeds ranging from seven to over 10 meters per second. Although offshore wind seems the most promising, the operation <coughs> and maintenance costs are fairly high and contribute to 20 to 30% of the levelized cost of energy which just consists of all the costs throughout the lifetime of the system. Offshore O&M is between five to 10 times more expensive than onshore, and this is because um, of accessibility issues as well as more destruction caused by different environmental conditions. Reducing the operation and maintenance costs remains a key challenge for offshore wind and will greatly influence the feasibility of future projects. Just last year, the U.S completed its first offshore wind farm, the Block Island Wind Farm in Rhode Island, with an installed capacity of 30 megawatts. This is the first of many projects, so it is important to find ways to reduce O&M costs for future installations. There are currently a multitude of current inspection methods used in order to, de to de detect defects on both on and offshore wind turbines. Onshore wind turbine blades provide maintenance workers with the opportunity to perform inspection from the ground 
using high-powered telescopes or drones. In addition, workers are able to climb to the top of the turbines and be laid down using, using the rope access technique. As Bahar stated, operations and maintenance costs for offshore wind turbines are five to ten times more expensive than onshore wind turbines, mostly due to the difficulty of inspection. As with onshore wind turbines, maintenance workers can either deploy drones with imagers to inspect the blades or use the rope access technique after positioning themselves atop the turbine. However, the increase in, in expense of operations and maintenance costs arises from the inaccessibility of offshore wind turbines. In order to reach these turbines, maintenance workers must first be transported out via boat or helicopter, increasing fuel costs. Secondly, offshore wind turbines are much more dangerous to work on, further increasing the cost of inspe inspection. Non-destructive testing, or NDT, is defined as quality control methods that do not damage or destroy the materials being tested, in our case, wind turbine blades. These NDT methods are used to, def to detect fatigue effects, structural flaws, or other such defects that could hinder the performance or efficiency of the, bl of the blades. Our aim for our project was to employ one such NDT technique that could offset operations and maintenance costs asso associated with operating offshore wind turbines. By deploying an unmanned NDT method that is stationed on the wind turbine, such as sensors mounted in a manner that allows easy viewing of the blades as they sweep by, costly manpower would seldom be needed and the safety of the maintenance workers would be ensured. By lowering inspection costs using NDT methods, higher operations and maintenance costs are offset, thus increasing the viability of offshore projects. Next, I will be discussing several of the most common non-destructive testing techniques used today, both while in operation and post-manufacturing. Firstly, for visual inspection, standard cameras and endoscopes are utilized to capture images of the blade surface. These blades can then be analyzed and defects are detected in this manner. The ultrasonic testing method is regarded as the quickest, most reliable, and most effective method of inspection. And for these reasons, ultrasonic inspection is the most common inspection technique employed by professionals. The main advantage of this method is that it allows us to view the interior of the blade as opposed to just the exterior as seen in visual inspection. The tap tests are generally <coughs> used to confirm results from an ultrasonic inspection, but can be used to detect defects in the blade independently as well. This method is based on the fact that the sound emitted when knocking on the turbine blade will differ depending on the thickness and material types. Tap testing equipment consisting of manual tapping ham hammers, portable bond testers, and computer-aided tap testers can produce an image of the blade which can then be used to detect defects. This method is especially good at detecting delamination and cracks. Vibration imaging system employs a high-speed camera to collect data about the vibrational frequency of the blade surface. The images are broken up into several photodiodes which are analogous to pixels. After the camera records a series of frames, the light intensity at each photodiode can be analyzed as a time series. The system is essentially an array of time data channels. Through the use of various software algorithms, the signatures are able to be converted into frequency signatures that can be used to detect or confirm defects on the blade surface. And lastly, infrared imaging as a non-destructive testing inspection method, method for blades is an emerging technology that is showing a lot of promise. Look, uh, infrared radiation is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we cannot see visibly, but we can feel <coughs> in the form of heat. This makes it so that we can look at objects and uh, be able to determine their temperature. This is because when the <coughs> excuse me, this is because objects emit heat proportional to their temperature. When you look at this object in the bottom right, all you see is a trash bag. That is that, well, that's what you see when you take a picture with a, a standard camera. Then, if we use an infrared camera, you can actually see the man behind the trash bag. You can see his hands because he is emitting more infrared radiation and thus being able to be able to see by the camera <coughs> over the trash bag. Infrared thermography is a technique where infrared radiation is detected and quantified as te temperature. There are two types of infrared, uh, infrared thermography, active thermography and passive thermography. The diagram on the right shows a, uh, an active thermography setup. When the material is exposed to a specific amount of heat, it is, you are able to analyze the response of the material, and defects such as cracks that are internal show different gradients. 
If we take away the heating devices, now we have a passive, heat, uh, a passive thermography system. This, this is used when materials have a naturally occurring heat difference within them and can often be attributed to the sun. Wind turbine blades can potentially be impacted by numerous types of defects. However, there were three that have the largest impact on the associated operation and maintenance costs. In identifying these three defects, the most important factors we considered were the impact on performance, impact on cost, feasibility with thermal imaging, how common the defect is, and whether the project is manageable for one semester. After considering these, we identified erosion, specifically leading edge erosion, delamination, and matrix cracking as the defects of primary concern. And what follows is a brief description of each defect. Erosion occurs on all wind turbine blades from being exposed to precipitation, abrasive airborne particles, and insects. Significant blade erosion, specifically on the leading edge, can significantly reduce aerodynamic performance and energy capture. This will have a significant impact on revenue since a turbine will not be generating energy to its full capacity and there will be associated inspection and repair costs. It is very feasible to detect erosion using infrared imaging and it has the advantage of being able to detect it earlier than a standard camera cam. In the top left is a photo showing the progression of erosion on the leading edge of a blade over its lifetime. Delamination occurs when the layers of a composite material begin to separate from one another as seen in the photo to the left. To the right, I'm sorry. The annual energy production of a wind turbine can be reduced by up to 20% when faced with significant delamination. Although the effect on energy production is relatively high, delamination is not as common as erosion and so it is less likely to be a problem. Delamination also has a lower chance of being detected by thermal imaging and we concluded that this would not be a manageable project to complete within the time given. Matrix cracking is a relatively uncommon defect that is caused by lightning and other natural occurrences. Matrix cracking is seldom the source of fatigue failure in wind turbine blades. However, it can lead to more serious defects that can cause damage and hinder performance. Matrix cracking is often responsible for delamination onset, and these cracks don't have a major impact on performance or cost until they develop into larger delamination defects that could eventually decrease energy production significantly. Thermal imaging is a viable tool for detecting cracks in a blade, and this project would be manageable for the time given. Now, in order to decide which of these three defects we wanted to focus on, a matrix was developed so we could score each defect based on the criteria mentioned earlier. Values between 0 and 10 were assigned for each criteria. It's worth noting that this analysis is not perfect and there are several other criteria that have not been considered. Also, in assigning the values, it was very subjective and one could argue that some of the values are too high or too low. However, erosion clearly stands out as the most important type of defect as its score, as you can see, is twice that of delamination and over twice that of cracks. Three things can happen when infrared radiation strikes an object. It can either be reflected, absorbed, or transmitted. When it did absorbed, it, transferred heat, it transfers heat to the material, which raises the temperature of the object. Infrared non-destructive research that we have found has utilized this method of infrared thermography, where the radiation absorbed into the material, and since the defects do not heat up at the same rate or cool down at the same rate as the surrounding area, they are visible using a thermal imager. But to detect erosion, we utilize the reflected radiation. When a material is eroded, it alters the, the surface properties of the blade, which affects the way radiation is reflected. So by finding the angle that the infrared radiation was reflected off of the blade, we were able to see erosion with the thermal imager. After deciding on leading edge erosion as our defect of interest, we found more information on its effect on the aerodynamics performance and energy capture. We found that there can be an increase from 6 to 500 percent in drag depending on the severity. This results in an energy loss from 5 to 25 percent. As stated before, infrared imaging also has the advantage of being able to detect erosion earlier than a standard camera can. It could also use either an active or a passive heat source, however, a passive source would be ideal since the sun could be used as a heat source during sunrise or sunset. It should be clear that leading edge erosion is a very serious issue in the wind industry and discovering a new, simple way of identifying it would be valuable in reducing operation and maintenance costs associated with wind turbines both offshore and onshore. With the help of the machine shop, 
we constructed a shield out of sheet metal that would allow us to carefully simulate er erosion on specific points of the blade without causing collateral damage to other points of the blade we weren't trying to affect, shown here. Next, we were given access to this 10-foot <coughs> Endurance S343 wind turbine blade, which came half-taped along the leading edge and untaped along the lower portion. The farther you mo move towards the end of the blade, the faster that portion of the blade has to travel, thus increasing the rate of erosion on this portion of the leading edge. Most wind turbine blades are deployed with tape along some portion of the leading edge in order to combat this increased rate of erosion. We then bought 80 grit glass beads. We chose this type of abrasive material because it is a general purpose abrasive glass media rated for metal, glass, rubber, and plastic surfaces, making it perfect for our composite blade. Furthermore, it removes substances from the surface without damaging the surface dimensions. Finally, with properly allotted time, it creates a satin matte finish, allowing us to easily uh, control the degree of erosion that we were trying to simulate. In addition, we were provided with a Charge Air Pro air compressor that allowed us to con control the exact pressure at which we projected the glass beads with a sandblasting gun that would allow us to project the beads. Finally, we attached a PVC pipe to the sandblasting gun that allowed us to carefully measure how far we wanted the sandblasting gun away from the leading edge. We chose sandblasting as the mechanism for erosion because it presents similar conditions that both on and offshore wind turbines experience. Because they are out at sea, offshore wind turbine blades travel through the air that has large amounts of salt in it, thus eroding the blade over time. Onshore wind turbines experience similar erosion. When maintenance workers drive up to the turbines or other cars travel by, they kick up dirt and sand into the air, which over time, as the blades travel past th pass through, erodes the blade because it, it's like traveling through sandpaper, as we were told by a blade technician. This is the exact wind turbine that we used. It's a three blade horizontal axis uh, with a sweep area of 32 meters squared and it's rated uh, for 52.2 kilowatts at 11 meters per second. Um, to begin, we divided the blade into 18 three inch sections, nine on the untaped portion and nine on the taped portion of the leading edge, as you can see if I tilt the blade. Each portion was assigned a value of one, two, or three, each to simulate varying degrees of erosion experienced by operating blades over time. One, signifying minimal erosion, not visible to the human eye, two, signifying moderate erosion, and three, signifying severe erosion, with obvious deformation in the composite material. For each segment de designated as a one, we decided to spray both the untaped and taped portions of the blade for five seconds, averaging 11 passes back and forth. Next, for the segment designated with a two, we sprayed both portions of the blade for 10 seconds, averaging 22 passes back and forth. Finally, for the untaped portion only, we sprayed the blade for seven and a half seconds, averaging 17 passes, while for, while for the tape portion, we sprayed the blade for 15 seconds, averaging 33 passes back and forth. We used the same 10-foot endurance blade that we had previously eroded to see if erosion affected the heating and cooling process of the blade. In order to heat the blade, we used the Simarec 2 hot plate to simulate the passive heating that would occur on a blade from the thermal en en energy provided by the sun. The purpose of the hot plate was not to heat the blade, but to induce electromag electromagnetic radiation onto the blade that would be effect effectively reflected back towards the camera, thus helping reveal defects in the blade. Next, we used an AVO TVS 850 thermal video system to take infrared images of the blade as it was cooling. This is the exact one that we used. To begin this portion of our experiment, we positioned the thermal imager down the leading edge to allow us to pick up infrared radiation from the hot plate. The hot plate was set at a heat level of 4 throughout the entirety of the experiment. We measured the distance between the hot plate and the leading edge, as well as the distance between the back of the hot plate and the leading edge. The differences in the distance, shown at the bottom there between the untaped and taped portions, is largely due to the varying thickness in the blade. Secondly, we measured the distance between the infrared, infrared camera lens and the defect. Next, we found the angle between the blade and the center focal point of the blade. Before taking images, 
We ensured that the hot plate had reached its maximum heating value. After heating the blade, we took images of the defected portions of the blade as it was cooling. Mm -hmm. We repeated this process for each level of erosion on both portions of the blade. These are the results we got for our from our experiment. You were looking at the infrared photos for trials one through three for the taped and the non-taped edges. First thing I'd like to point out is that the angle in which we took these images remained pretty constant throughout the experiment. And by doing this, this allowed us to uh, know that the proportion of reflected energy that was reaching the, reaching the camera was the same throughout. Also notice that our third trial decreased the exposure time of sandblasting versus the, on the, uh, versus the non-taped edge. So for the taped edge, we have 15 seconds on the third trial, whereas we decreased rather than increasing on the third trial for our non-taped edge to, to 7.5, because we noticed during the, when we were eroding it at the, medium, uh, at the medium degree, that that should actually be our highest degree, because it was, it was eroding it so much that if we kept going, then it was gonna eat through the blade more than we wanted to. So we went ahead and just dialed it down a little bit. Um, all that set aside though, we were, able to, we were able to detect erosion. You can see in each one of these images that the white area is the hottest area of the blade, which is where the, where, where the most noticeable part of the erosion that you would be able to see visually is. Then it's surrounded by a more red area, which symbolizes the area that is eroded, but is not necessarily as visible. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and consider these temperature ranges further. You might, uh, you might notice that on each of these photos that the temperature range is actually changing throughout. And this was a problem that we, uh, we encountered during our experiment. Um, it, was, it was a source of error um, from the hot plate because not only were we getting reflected radiation, but we were also getting some absorbed radiation onto the blade. And so that changed our results a little bit, but it's still very obvious that you were able to see the erosion. Um, if you look at the, fir at the first temperature range, it starts out at 80, at, uh, with a temperature range of 70 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, and that increases to 65 to 94, and then from s up to 67 to 118. Um, and that's because we started with the lowest one, and as we were heating, we moved to the highest one. And so that heating built up over time, and it ended up increasing our temperature range. Secondly, uh, one thing we could have done to prevent this is we could have locked our temperature range, and that would have made it so that the range that was at the bottom remained constant throughout. But also having the the, uh, the, the thermal image, the uh, sorry, the hot plate close so close to the blade that it was heating it, that would have made it so that it wasn't necessarily as visible to see the erosion. So in the future, we think that it would be better to move the hot plate away and to uh, so that it's further away, and you're only getting reflected radiation, a lot less of the absorbed absorbed radiation, and also lock that temperature range down. So um, also having that temperature range different uh, makes it really hard to compare uh, in a thermal image to another thermal images. Uh, so let's go ahead and we'll look at them individually. So this is the highest degree of erosion. Um, you can see from the visual image that the tip is very noticeably erode, eroded, that right there on the, uh, that part. But if you look at the one on the top right, you can, you can see a little bit of the, how it's whiter uh, so around that area. And that, that white area is represented by the red versus the, uh, in, the, in the thermal image, it's represented by the surrounded red area because it's not quite as hot as the extremely eroded, but it is, it is still there. And that's what we were trying to detect. And you can clearly tell that from the infrared image that it's much more noticeable than from the visual images, especially because that angle on the left is the angle that we were looking at it there. If we were able to get this clunky camera up to that angle that we had right there, we might be able to see it even better. So this is our lowest degree of erosion. Now visibly, with the same angle, you can't see it at all. But if you look up at, at the, uh, the better angle that we got, you can still see that one just a little bit, but there's no uh, extreme erosion. Also, this temperature range is a lot lower than the other ones. So in this case, the white represented the more extreme erosion, and the red was just the surrounding area. Whereas then after that, over here, this is where the taped edge starts, which is right here. And that, so that right there is going to uh, not make this image as like over there, it's what you want to ignore more uh, because the, uh, the red is really what the surrounding is as compared to the previous with the yellow. Um, yeah. So in conclusion, uh, this preliminary research shows that infrared radiation uh, is a viable option for viewing the leading edge erosion. Uh, we think uh, it'd be a really good idea to mount a camera to, uh, to a turbine rotor and look down the leading edge. 
Um, that would be right around this, uh, right, right around this area. It'd be able to look straight down the leading edge and be able to get a, a, a really good uh, profile of the blade. Uh, this would be allow you to determine the effectiveness effectiveness of the erosion preventive products uh, like the tape. There are also now solutions out uh, these liquid solutions that are uh, supposed to decrease the the amount of erosion. Um, and since there's new products out, you always want to be able to test those. And this is a way that you can go through doing that. Over the past semester, I've been working with various software in order to model and run a simulation on a wind turbine blade. The numerical modeling and design tool, which was developed by Sandia Energy, was used to create a model of the blade. This model was then imported into ANSYS, where a simulation was performed and an aerodynamic analysis was conducted. Unfortunately, I was unable to create an accurate model of our blade in NUMED. I was, however, able to develop an accurate model in SOLIDWORKS, which you can see here. I plan to alter the surface properties in order to model the varying degrees of erosion that we have induced, induced on the leading edge during the remainder of the semester. I will then perform an aerodynamic analysis on the various models in ANSYS and erosion effect on the various aerodynamic metrics can be determined. So in the future, we would like to reproduce this experiment under more controlled conditions. Um, first, we'd like to erode a blade that hasn't previously used in the field because there was already erosion on the blade, very minor, uh, but it did is going to reflect the results a little bit. Uh, we'd also like to test the hot plate, like I said earlier, from different distances and different angles, uh, use, and then also use a solar simulator as a heat source. Uh, that was what we were thinking about using at the beginning of the experiment, but we were unable to get the resources we needed to get put that in place. Um, also. We would uh, like to, uh, like I said earlier, assess how tape and new solutions uh, can reduce erosion and compare them and contrast them against each other. Um, determine the economic viability of implementing this technique by uh, doing a cost-benefit analysis. And really, you know, you take into account the, the, the long-term benefits of being able to get big data and be able to assess these trends, have more predictive maintenance, and decrease operational maintenance costs overall in the future. Um, then we'd also like to test the infrared, uh, the infrared test using an infrared imager that we've deployed in the field. This is an older imager. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it does its job very well, but it's old and it's clunky. There are imagers out there that are much smaller that can do just, just as much, if not better. Um, and finally, we'd also think that monitoring the, uh, the, the trailing edge for delamination, which is the back edge right here, where that's more commonly seen, would be another, uh, another viable project to work on. All right, we would like to thank our advisor, Dr. Miles, for his guidance throughout the semester. Remy Pangle and Phil Sturm at the Center for Wind Energy. Mark Starnes at the JMU sh Machine Shop for coming up with the idea to sandblast our blade. George Hagerman, Charles Newcomb, and Albert Pieces for their industry and research expertise. And lastly, we would like to thank our parents. Thank you. Any questions? What did you guys find to be the most difficult part of this whole project? <coughs> Define difficult. <laughs> uh, like, did you find the uh, lab work, the actual sandblasting, uh, hard, or like applying research uh, to what you're actually doing? Uh, in general, when we first started, we were doing more of a literature review and a market analysis, mm -hmm. and a lot of the numbers out there aren't clearly given as to how much it actually costs, what the operations and maintenance costs actually are for offshore. Um, I know for Aiden, his most difficult portion of this would have to be the software. I know he spent like hours <laughs> doing uh, simulations and tutorials and stuff. So I think for each of us, it was probably a different spot along the way. Sandblasting, however, was probably one of the easier portions of this because we had help with Dr. Miles and Phil. And, and Phil. Did you test this on any other kinds of metals besides? Um, we didn't test the thermography on any other metals. Um, the uh, shield that we used that was metal was affected by the erosion, but we didn't analyze it in any way. Uh, there, are re there is research out there for it being used in other industries, uh, concrete I know for one, um, different metals. Uh, it's used to monitor different types of equipment. Uh, even even. It's even been used in, for wind turbines, but not for the blades. It's been used for uh, the rotor area to see the, uh, the, um, how, the, how the components, the mechanical components heat up over time and can uh, see when those are breaking down. I think I saw a hand back there. Yes, uh, actually two part uh, question. Do you happen to know like, what, what's the mean time to failure of a turbine blade in service? 
And then I guess the second part is, are they, is it typical to wait until they fail before they're replaced? Or is there like a, um, some kind of a, you know, uh, I can't think of the term now, but a, a maintenance program where they're replaced periodically? Uh, I'm not sure about that first question. Um, but for the second one, yes, there are uh, turbine technicians that go out regularly to uh, perform maintenance on blades. Um, that was a part that we, uh, Mike touched on earlier about how uh, offshore wind is more expensive uh, for operation maintenance than onshore because you have to actually send those people out there to do the maintenance. Uh, so that does that is a preventive measure, but our technique would allow it to so that you can <coughs> offset those, those maintenance costs with more operational costs by being able to view those defects and be have more predictive maintenance and not go out, go out there as often. So you were talking about drones, could you mount a thermal imaging camera on a drone and use this on a large turbine? I think I told, told you about that before this yeah, presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to hear a little more about it. <laughs> uh, our project ended up going a different direction. Uh, we decided to go with mounting over, uh, okay. over uh, working with a drone. Can, can we go back for a moment to the um, images that show the blade in the infrared? All of them, uh, or just one? No, of them? no, no. The, these two in particular, the highest okay. versus the lowest. Just I think for the benefit of the audience, um, you, you might want to. <clears throat> I sometimes refer to that what there is kind of a white and red spot as sort of a bullseye. Maybe put that into perspective with regard to to make sure spatially everybody understands where that is relative to where the the erosion uh, was induced. Okay. Um, so on the bullet, on on the actual blade. Um, this is the highest degree. So this was induced right here. Um, you not be, might not be able to see it as well from up here, but by looking here, you can see uh, this is the most extreme area right here. And then if you correspond to uh, this part of the blade right here, the white right there, which I guess is the bullseye, um, would be the most extreme part of the erosion. And then also when we're looking at this thermal imager, we're not capturing this area that's uh, down below under here with the thermal imager because the reflectance isn't, isn't working uh, it's not reflecting off of that part of the surface, but it is reflecting around the surrounding area. Um, and that's what this red this red area would be right here. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, so in the next one, the lowest degree, we see something similar, but maybe not quite as pronounced. Yeah, so um, visually on the one on the left, you really can't, you really can't see it at all. Um, on the top, you can see it a little bit, um, but all you're seeing is the minor erosion. There's not really any major erosion you're seeing. So uh, since there wasn't any major erosion, what there is in the thermal imager is, since the also the temperature range, um, it's important to note, is, is a lot lower. And since that temperature range is a lot lower, that white area represents a much lower degree um, uh, uh, of temperature uh, and, and a lower degree of erosion. But, um, but that little white spot is, is, is fair to say, a little higher, more re greater reflecting area than its surroundings. Yes, because um, if you look on the scale, that is, that is rated at a higher temperature, so it's going to, that's going to be the area that reflected more radiation. <coughs> Pardon me, I guess related to Dr. Miles' question there, does the curvature of the blade cause any challenges with regard to your uh, test setting? Uh, definitely. Um, when <coughs> if, you were to, if you were to mount a camera on here, I would think that you would actually want to have it so it could, it could move onto either side of the leading edge um, and be able to change its angle. Um, We'd also think that this would be used with uh, using the sun as the heat source and the reflectance source, um, but yeah, that definitely that definitely posed a problem during the experimentation. I spent a good amount of time just taking the hot plate and moving it around, trying to find the right angle, um, and also moving the thermal imager to understand the best angle to put that at to see it. Okay. Just going to add to Dr. Lawrence's point, right? I think you know this, David, that the um, the imager can't distinguish between emitted and reflected. So you've got to control one to be able to see the variations in the other. Can we go back to where the we you had we were talking about mounting the camera on the turbine itself? <coughs> this one. Okay, so in that image, it's mounted to the device in the rear, not on the blades themselves. So would that be effective at actually seeing the erosion on the blades themselves? So would you be trying to mount it something similar to that image on the right, where you can see down each individual blade? So. Yeah. three cameras on each turbine? Yeah, the one on the left, um, I meant to show this one when I was going through the slide, is that the place that we would mount it would be right, right around <coughs> here. Okay. And that would enable you to look down the blade such, such a way that's described in this picture. 
So instead of, you wouldn't have one camera per turbine, you'd have probably three or multiple. Three or more. Um, you could also also a possibility is putting it actually embedded in the blade. Um, we didn't really go through that in our analysis or think about that too much, but I, it's a possibility also. It's further research. <coughs> well done. Okay. Thank you.